Hi, uh, this is a video on how to operate a classic amateur radio HF transceiver from the mid 1970s. There are a number of different companies in the 1970s making transceivers that use the same technology as this. Uh, people like Kenwood, ICOM, even KW. Um, they all use basically the same idea, but obviously with, diff with slightly different frequencies and things. Uh, this particular transceiver is Yesu's FT101B. And these were made in sort of 1975-1976. So let's go back to basics. This radio and most of the ones from this period cover a frequency range of 1.8 megahertz to 30 megahertz. Uh, and that is the often described as the HF part of the amateur radio band. But it's not a continuous coverage. If we were to look at the frequency bands that are available to radio amateurs, we find, and they're done in terms of bands, in terms of wavelength, um, we have the 160 meter band, which is 1.8, to 2 megahertz. Then there's a gap and the 80 meter band 3.5 to 3.8. Then another gap and so forth. And if you look at these frequencies you'll notice that most of these wave bands are considerably less than 500 kilohertz wide. Uh, the only exception to that rule is the 10 meter band where we have 28 to well, we'll call it 30 megahertz, which is 2 megahertz. But all the other bands can be covered with a VFO that only has a range of 500 kilohertz. There's a few things that you have to be aware of that are very different from what you'd see on a modern radio. So just to highlight the differences, this is a transceiver from the 1990s. And when I switch it on, the first thing you notice is digital readout with the frequency on. Uh, this free readout is showing 3.61 megahertz. Uh, that's in the 80 meter band. And if we turn the tuning knob, it, the frequency readout follows as you'd expect. How does this work? Why are we able to so easily set a frequency on here? Well, the reason is because this set uses very complicated electronics. The frequency that you're seeing here is based on a reference frequency inside the set which is fixed and it usually uses something like a quartz crystal. What you're actually seeing here on the display is a variable frequency oscillator that's inside this radio that generates the signals we're going to transmit. But then there's a system of electronics that mathematically relates the frequency that we're generating with that reference frequency. And when we're turning this knob, what we're actually doing is changing the ratio. So that, ref that VFO will be locked to the reference, so it won't change. The only way that that can happen is because there are thousands of transistors inside here. Um, and that's made possible by the use of integrated circuits. Now, when we go back to our mm -hmm. 1976 radio, none of that technology was available to the people that built this. Uh, it would have required an enormously larger radio to put that in. So the way that they achieved getting an accurate frequency set on here was by using a mechanical VFO. And that's what this does. This is actually a very accurate frequency generator, but only over a very small range of frequencies. And the adjustment for that is driven through a gearbox. And as I'm turning this control, I'm operating a whole load of gears inside, which are, are reducing the movement of, of this knob. And you can see there are dials here which are fixed onto those cogwheels, which change as I rotate this. It's impossible to make a variable frequency oscillator that's stable and would work over the range 1.8 to 30 megahertz. So what they've actually done is to make an oscillator that only tunes across a range of 500 kilohertz. 
and then they mix the output from that oscillator produce the frequencies we want and different crystals for that other oscillator are switched in by this band switch down here and this shows 160 meaning the 160 meter band 1.8 megahertz 83.5 and so on and so forth now as I said before when we get to the 10 meter band the 28 megahertz band that band is 2 megahertz wide but the oscillator in here will only do 500 kilohertz so they've got round that by having bands 10A, 10B, 10C and 10D. One nice thing about these old radios is if, if we undo these two fixing screws here called quarter turn ones we can actually take the lid off this and if we look inside just down here in the corner you can see a whole load of crystals and that is what the band selector switch are switching in to produce the various uh, oscillations to mix with that VFO. The VFO is here in the center in that metal box to screen it from everything and we can just about see the gears down there that, uh, that form part of that slow motion. Well this radio is what's called a superhet and it works by mixing different signals together to generate various other signals. Um, the super bit means that it's supersonic, i.e. it's not audio, it's outside the human hearing range. And the het bit is because it uses heterodyning. Now, there are various ways of mixing signals together. Uh, but essentially, if you just simply took two signals and put them together, you would get the frequency of the first signal, the frequency of the second signal, the difference between the two, i.e. one minus the other, and the sum of the two, the one plus the other. So you'd have four signals coming out. But there are different types of mixers, and a mixer called a double balance mixer removes the two signals that you've originally fed in. So you're simply left with the sum and the difference. This is actually a triple conversion superhet. Now, the great thing about a superhet is that you can have an IF amplifier with a lot of gain, lots and lots of stages, uh, but there's no need to tune it. It's tuned up in the factory uh, and it needs no adjustment. All the adjustment can be done before the mixing stage that produces a particular frequency, which is the IF frequency. So this radio, let's take an example. We're on the 80 meter band and we're trying to receive 3.65 megahertz. What happens is the first mixing stage takes that oscillator that we saw uh, being switched by the band switch on the front, uh, the particular crystal for that, and the frequency we want, the 3.65 megahertz, is subtracted from that heterodyne frequency. So the heterodyne frequency for 80 meters is 9.25 megahertz. That's the crystal that we've selected. So the first mixer takes the 9.25 and it subtracts what we're trying to listen to, the 3.65 megahertz, and that gives us 5.87. Of course, it'll also give us a sum, but there's a filter that filters out the sum of those two, which of course will be I don't know, 11, 12 megahertz, something like that, the addition of those two. The second mixer stage is where the VFO comes in. And what happens there is the thing we've just produced, this 5.87, is subtracted from the VFO frequency. Now the VFO actually has a rate, actually starts at 8.7 megahertz, and it goes up to 9.2 megahertz. So that's the 500 kilohertz range that I talked about earlier. So if we want to receive 3.56 megahertz, the VFO will need to be set to 9.05, and you'll see why in a minute. So the result of that second mixer is 9.05, what we've set the VFO to for this particular frequency, subtracted from the thing that we worked out earlier, the first mixer stage, 
which and that result if you remember was 5.87 and that gives us a result of 3.18 and the IF frequency of this radio the frequency at which all the clever stuff is done all the gain and all the processing and everything else that is 3.18 megahertz actually it's it's very slightly different than that but that's close enough there's then a third mixer and in that one we subtract 3.18 megahertz from this and what's left will be the audio signal as i say it's actually slightly more complicated for single sideband but you get the general idea of what a triple conversion means so what do we actually need to know to operate this radio well the first thing we need to know is what these frequency what what the bands that are shown here actually mean so for instance if we select the 40 meter band we have to know that 40 meter band starts at 7 megahertz we can then look at the dial here and where that dial reads zero we know that that is a frequency of 7 megahertz as we turn this knob when we get to 100 on there that corresponds to a frequency of 7.1 megahertz and if we set this smaller dial for instance to 50 that would correspond to a frequency of 7 1 5 0 and you can see we're halfway between the 100 and the 200 so that's 50 again if we select another band for instance the 20 meter band we know that the 20 meter band starts at 14 megahertz so a zero and again you notice it's in what well, it's not in red so we're reading the black scale here so when that reads zero that is 14 megahertz if we select 100 on here that's 14.1 megahertz and if we say selected 20 on here that would be 14.12 megahertz so we do have to know what the bands represent in terms of starting frequencies in order to select this knob the exception to that is of course on the on the uh, 10 meter band now where we're, we're showing for instance band 10b um, that would you have to add now 500 so it's 20 28.5 uh, when you're on the red lettering here if we select band 10c we're now on 29 megahertz so now we're reading the top scale because this is in white so that would be 29 megahertz and obviously if we set it to 10d then we'd be reading the bottom scale again so that would be 29.5 megahertz so it's not too difficult to understand so long as you realize where you are in terms of these bands and the frequencies that so back at our 1990s radio you notice that there's just one control on the front for frequency and that's the vfo that band switch has been replaced by buttons here which allow us to scroll through the different frequency bands now the reason that that is possible is because electronics had moved on since the 1970s the amplifiers in this radio are designed to have a flat frequency response for the bands that are in operation so the main power amplifier in this will amplify any signal from 1.8 to 30 megahertz at exactly the same amplification uh, the only thing that happens is the band switch which is in a filter that removes anything that's outside of the band we're trying to use but otherwise there is no adjustments necessary for the actual amplification in the set in the 1976 radio things are very different we have our adjustment control for the tuning for the vfo but we also now have another control hill called pre-selector and this has a tuned circuit on the front end of the radio which allows us to 
manually tune up the amplifier because the amplifiers in this weren't as flat so we needed some form of tuned circuit in order to to make this work and you can hear when you've tuned it because the noise goes up considerably as we get to the 40 meter band which is what this is currently set to okay we've talked about how to tune the radio into different frequencies the only other controls of interest on the front here are the gain controls you've got an rf gain for the front end an af gain for the audio part there's uh, an RF attenuator that you can switch in to if you've got very strong signals to stop them swamping the radio. There's a noise blanker that gets rid of interference type noise, although that's less of a problem these days. And there's a thing to calibrate the, uh, the tuning scale. If you switch this on, um, you will find that there's a signal every 100 kilohertz, a uh, very strong signal at every 100 kilohertz. Uh, so you can that, that in that way you can calibrate the tuning scale uh, which as you can see is a little bit off but not very much I hope that's been of interest in part two of this video I'll talk about how to set the, this rig up to transmit